Charles R. Solis Jr. and Conse Sound Solis are the co-founders and directors of the Reach Family Institute, an educational organization specializing in teaching parents how to parent with the brain in mind. Reach serves children of all levels of ability from all segments of society. Reach focuses specifically on work with exceptional children. And under Reach's umbrella, Brain Fit Kids focuses on work with well children. They have trained hundreds of doctors, therapists, and teachers in Venezuela and brought desperately needed help to thousands of very poor children and families throughout that country. They have lectured to parents on every continent except Antarctica and have been featured speakers at international conferences in Vatican City, Switzerland, Poland, Denmark, Venezuela, Washington, D.C., and the United Nations in New York City. This duo has over 40 years experience helping children across the neurodivergent spectrum thrive, and we're excited to speak with them today. Thank you so much for joining me today on the Brain Possible podcast. It is such an honor to meet you and to learn from you. Um, Before we get to the what exactly around your work, can you shed some light on the why? Why make brain health and working with exceptional kids your life's work? Oh, boy. (laughs) That's a big one. Um, Gee whiz. You know, uh, well, at least for me personally, um, when I, uh, I I got involved in the work uh, when I was very young, I was 20, 21, I guess, um, 22. And, um, uh, you know, often people think that, uh, you know, people who've gotten involved in this kind of work, do so because they have some personal experience, you know, somebody in the family or a friend Mm -hmm. or something like that uh, who had struggles. And, um, and with me, that was not the case. Uh, It was much more, um, I think, uh, and and I've, I've sort of come to, um, to recognize it uh, as the years have passed that um, it's really what I was designed. I was, uh, designed to do. Um, I had had no experience with uh, um, kids with dis- with, uh, with special needs at all, uh, kids with brain injury. Um, and um, I was uh, graduated from college with a degree in pre-med, uh, didn't get into med school. And so I was trying to figure out what I'm going to do with myself. And, uh, and I just kind of stumbled upon uh, the work and uh, fell in love with it. Uh, so it was almost like a lightning bolt hit me, and um, and this voice pretty much said, "This is what you're supposed to do." Mm-hmm. And um, and yeah. with me was I was uh, I'm from Brazil, so I was uh, doing speech therapy and looking to start getting some hands-on uh, experience and. Same thing, accidentally run into a clinic in Brazil that was doing the work that had started in the United States. And and then they asked me if I wanted to come and study for a couple of years. And that's how we met. So when I came, that's where he was. And that's so we actually have worked together longer than we've been married. Oh, okay. (laughs) And but that's yeah, and the and same thing. I don't have any experience, but I didn't have any uh, children with difficulties or um, siblings. It's just Mm -hmm. the the attraction. So started speech therapy and kind of evolved. Yeah, Yeah. and and as far as as far as a why, you know, for you know, getting up every morning and doing it uh, after 45 years, um, it's really because. You know, the human brain just has so much potential and really all of us uh, should always be striving to reach that potential. And, uh, and, and we, you know, we just, we, we just take it for granted and that it's going to happen. And so often it doesn't. And, uh, and since we have the tools to help people realize that, um, that's what keeps us going. 
Um, and and the need it's is just children. the need is just so tremendous. You know, I mean, you know, when it's when you're talking about children who have, you know, really obvious difficulties, that that's pretty clear. But we, you know, we have a, we have an absolute epidemic uh, mm-hmm. in this country, really worldwide, of children with learning difficulties, behavior difficulties. You know, the rates of autism are just through the roof, and so much of that is preventable. Uh, and all that's required is for parents to have an awareness and an understanding of how the how the brain works, and and it's really not that complicated. Um, So that's kind of what keeps us going. Yeah. And the results of the children. uh, A lot of people say to us, no, it must be so depressing or so, you know, exhausting. And and it's nothing depressing at all because what we're looking at is first we're looking at what a child can do. So we're we're always focusing on function as opposed as the disability, because you know, that's where we, we begin. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and to see kids that are blind beginning to learn to see and to read, it's pretty exciting. Yes. Uh, you know, it's, so the changes that the children make and, and seeing the transformation, not just on the child that we're working with, but on the parents themselves, as well as the siblings around the the child, it's pretty powerful. It's pretty exciting. Mm -hmm. That's the paycheck. (laughs) That's it. That's right. Exactly. You said something in um, your speech that you shared with me um, about what children, exceptional children can teach us. Mm. Do you you recall what you said there? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um, You know, it's... uh, there's, um, there's, just, you know, there's something magical that happens when you spend time uh, working with a kid who's struggling, uh, or and raising or raising, uh, or or yeah, or, or or raising a child who's struggling, mm-hmm. and it's, um, you know, it's not, it's not, um, it's not earth shattering. It's something that kind of happens almost. Uh, imperceptibly below the surface in the, in the daily work. Um, but, uh, you know, so many of the kids that we work with that they, you know, they don't, they don't um, have a whole lot that they can contribute to society, at least, at least when they start out. Um, and so, so, you know, they're often seen as, um, as a drain, on, on society, on resources. And, and I just think that's so misguided because um, when we, you know, when we, when we recognize, you know, their dignity and we, and, and, and we try to help them develop more ability, um, there's, there's just something that, that goes on that uh, transforms us. Um, it's, it's, it's hard to put into words, really, uh, but we, we've seen it happen over and over and over again. Um, there's, a, um, there's a marvelous, marvelous book written by a good friend of ours um, that's called The Power of the Powerless. And it's written by a guy named Chris DeVink, and um, he wrote the book uh, uh, about his brother, um, Oliver. Um, no, no, not, not Oliver. Um, oh gosh, what's his, what was his brother's yes, name? That, that was, Oliver. was it Oliver? Yeah, okay. Yeah. Um, anyway, but the, 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 the whole idea of the book is that, you know, he had this brother who, who couldn't do anything. He was blind and mobile. Um, and, and yet, uh, just because everybody in the family was, was, you know, caring for him and helping him all the time, it transformed all of their lives. Mm-hmm. And, um, and, and, and that's something that we have seen repeatedly over and over and over again throughout the years. Um, so I, you know, I, always, I, I refer to the kids as our greatest, um, our greatest natural resource. Um, again, not because of what they can do, because so many of them can't really do anything but rather because of what they do to us. And they teach us a lot. We had uh, the best example that I have was 
we were at one point many, many years ago at uh, having dinner with one of our families who's, uh, who had seven children and this number seven was born blind and sensate severe brain damage. And they worked with him. We worked with uh, the parents for many, many years. And at one point we were having dinner at their house and for some reason, there was a reporter uh, there that was just happened to be visiting us in Venezuela. This happened. And so he was a French reporter and came to the dinner. And so the mom was explaining the work she had done with uh, her son and you know, the changes. He went from uh, not seeing to uh, being able to see and uh, read, recognize words. And uh, he couldn't speak, but he sure... Uh, could communicate in his way. Anyway, mm -hmm. he had uh, had some pretty uh, pretty good changes. He's still immobile. And the reporter said to the mother, you know, after the mom explained all the work she's, she had done and the changes that he have, uh, had, the reporter said to her, you know, it seems to me that you did a lot of work for not for him not to recover completely, basically not, no, not, not wow. as much results. And, um, and the mother, we thought this is a pretty interesting position to be in, see what she would say. And she, without hesitating, she said, yeah, that's true that we did a lot of work and maybe in somebody's minds, in somebody's eyes, for that much results, because obviously she didn't agree that the results wasn't much. Yeah. And she said, but if I had to do it all over again, I would do exactly, uh, I would do it all over again without hesitating because working with him and uh, you know, spending time with my son taught me what being human is all about. Mm, and yes. that kind of, that just summarized, you know, to me, the whole, uh, what the children do to teach us, you know, yes. that being human is yeah. pretty special and and the value does not change if you have a disability or not yes that's well, beautiful um, well um charles you took a group of brain injured young adults on an epic journey through the appalachian trail that trip made history can you tell us that story um sure so in um 1978 uh, I was working in a school with young adults um, who had a variety, or, you know, a variety of different um, uh, diagnoses, but they were all young, you know, young adults, uh, 18 to 30 years of age, who, um, had, done a home program. who had done a home program. Um, mm -hmm. So their, their, their families had worked with them at home, and then they had entered into this school, which was a boarding school. Um, and... Uh, so we, ha uh, we had a group of kids who had done very, very well. Um, and we were trying to come up with a, uh, some sort of a, a, a project, a challenge that would um, sort of help them make the transition from a very kind of controlled, structured environment at the school mm -hmm. to the kind of chaotic uh, real world. Um, mm -hmm. and, um, you know, structure is a fantastic thing. Um, it, you know, it's, especially for uh, people with brain injuries, uh, they, 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 uh, thrive. They do much better when their lives are highly structured. Mm -hmm. um, but the problem with that is that when you want, when you go out into the real world and try to make it on your own, well, the real world is really unstructured, you know, you, mm -hmm. you, you don't, you don't know what's going to happen next. Mm -hmm. And um, so, so we were trying to come up with something that would, would help to, to make that bridge between structure and lack of structure. And um, so this idea for the, for hiking the Appalachian trail came about and um, out on the trail, it was, uh, we could control some things, but there were lots of things that were just beyond control. Mm -hmm. uh, can't control the weather. Uh, you can't control whether you get blisters. Well, you can a little bit, but, you know, mm -hmm. just things happen um, when you're out on the trail that, um, that you just have to deal with. Mm -hmm. 
Right. And then, so we thought that that would be that would provide sort of a nice environment for us to be able to try and work with this. Um, nobody had ever done anything like that before. Um, six. And um, so anyway, um, I was I was chosen to lead the group, and and out of about forty two students, we selected six to do the hike. Uh, there were four young men and two women, two young women, and. Um, mm-hmm. Uh, I had an assistant, uh, uh, um, a young woman from Australia um, named Lynn Lidwina. Um, and, uh, and on the 8th of April of 1978, uh, we started hiking from Springer Mountain in Georgia. And um, we hiked through the spring, the summer, uh, and into the early, well, just before the beginning of fall uh, for five and a half months and um, finished hiking on the 15th of September. And it was an extraordinary experience. I mean, thank God, I, thank God we were young. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, most, most people who uh, hike the trail, or, or at least most people who through hike it, um, do so alone. Um, we did it as a group, which made it much, much more difficult. Um, it's hard, you know, uh, People hike at different paces. Mm-hmm. Uh, people get on each other's nerves. There, there are all kinds of reasons why it's difficult to hike with a group of people. Right. Um, <clears throat> so most people, even those who kind of you know start out saying, "I'm going to hike this with my buddy," after two weeks, you know, they they they're like, you know, no, I'm going off on my own, um, and you hike on your own. Mm-hmm. So. Um, so that's a big. That was a big challenge. Um, obviously, the physical challenge is enormous. Um, there are a number of long distance hiking trails in the United States. Um, another very comp- um, well known one is the Pacific Crest Trail, which goes from Mexico to Canada. And most people think that that would be the more difficult trail to hike. Um, the mountains are higher, you know, you're, you get, get as, as high as 10,000, 12,000 feet. Um, whereas in the Appalachian Mountains, the highest mountain, I think, is 5,400 and some. So they're not as grand as the uh, Sierras and the Cascades. But, the, but those people who have hiked both uh, all say that the, um, the Appalachian Trail is by far the more difficult one. It's really punishing. Um, so, so, you know, we had to deal with all of that. We had to Mm -hmm. deal with the, just the, you know, the physical uh, aspect of, of hiking. Um, we had to deal with weather, uh, and that ranged all the way from, you know, extreme heat to snow, rain. Um, it was, uh, it it was, it was a tough, uh, a a tough slog. Um, but what was extraordinary was the, you know, the ways in which the young people changed during the course of the hike. Um, when we started off in the beginning, um, my, my, um, my assistant and myself, we, we, we pretty much had to do everything. Um, the students were really knocked for a loop by the idea that this wasn't going to end after the weekend, you know, um, cause prior to do, to starting the hike, we did a lot of practice hikes, you know, but we would go out for two or three days and they, they always knew that they were going back to a hot shower. Mm-hmm. Um, and whereas out on, well, once we started the trail, there was none of that. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that was really challenging. And in the beginning, they, they were pretty, um, uh, they, they had a tough time. So, so Lidwin and I had to pretty much do everything for them, even to the point of, for some of the young people, um, literally tying their boots mm-hmm. uh, because they were they their their manual dexterity took a took a nose dive, um, but uh, we kept at it and with persistence, little by little, you know the the brain changes when you're doing all this stuff to it, mm-hmm. and uh, and by the end, by the time we got to Maine, uh, five five months later, five and a half months later. They, we, we pretty much did nothing. Um, we hiked with them, but mm-hmm. they cooked all the meals. Wow. They, made, they made the decisions as to where we were, how far we were going to hike each day, where we would stop. 
where the where our support team would meet us. Um, so it was pretty amazing. Um, wow, there was a there was an incredible transformation. Um, you know, it was really nowadays wilderness wilderness therapy is the thing. Right. Um, but in 1978, it was it wasn't. There was no name uh, for that. <laughs> no, no, and and you know this, and this is long before cell phones, um, mm-hmm. any of those things. Uh, mm-hmm. So it was a it was a pretty risky endeavor to take on, um, and uh, and it, it's the only time anybody had uh, had attempted it, and nobody has ever done it since, mm-hmm. as far as I know. Um, mm-hmm. No, you know, no group of young people with uh, with developmental challenges mm-hmm. has, has done it as a group. Yep, so mm-hmm. this sort of Mr. Fisher. Uh, well, we had one. Yeah, Mr. Fisher was one of the students. Um, he was a young guy who um, who didn't who who had who had no real um, uh, verbal communication. Mm-hmm. I mean, we knew that we knew that he could talk because every once in a while we would hear him say a word mm-hmm. here and there. Um, and, uh, but, you know, nothing, you know, in terms of, uh, communicating in sentences and having a conversation. And he had, he used to speak, right? Uh, Younger. uh, When he was younger, he had spoken. Um, he had spent before coming into the school, he had spent a number of years, like 10 years in a, in a mental institution. Mm -hmm. Uh, He had been misdiagnosed and, um, so spent a, a long time in an institution. Anyway, long story short. Um, out on the trail, you know, we we thought, you know, maybe just maybe just the hiking, you know, the the sort of dev- the stress on his respiratory system and all of that might help to get him talking. Well, that didn't do anything. He he could hike up up and down mountains like a like a goat, um, but it didn't do anything for his speech. Um, and then we decided, well, and then we decided <laughs> that um, maybe the reason he wasn't speaking was that he didn't have enough need to speak. He he had. When he was in the institution, he had become very good at getting everybody to do things for him. Mm-hmm. And, and, and we began to see that out on the trail. You know, the other students would help to make his food. They would, yeah. they would help. They would put up his tent for him. So he, he had become a very good manipulator. And, <laughs> um, and so what we decided to That's do was uh, we decided to try and put some pressure on him and increase the need for him to communicate if he wanted help. Mm-hmm. And, um, and in the end, that worked. Uh, and he ended up uh, he ended up speaking in sentences. Um, it was a total transformation of his language abilities. So, wow, that's yeah, incredible. It was, a, it was a pretty pretty amazing experience. One 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 of the one of the biggest challenges I've ever taken on. Wow. <laughs> and and I finished it on my on my twenty fifth birthday, the fifteenth of uh, September that year. <laughs> so that was pretty cool. Wow, that's awesome. Um, congratulations. And that's still a, a beautiful story. Thank you for sharing it with me. Sure. Thank you. Are you still in touch with um, any of those children or you know, there, adults there, now? Yes. Well, I mean, you know, some of them are actually older than I am. Um, because at the time I was 25, there were there were a few who were 28 or 30. Okay. Um, and um, lost touch with um, all but one of them. Two or Cameron and... Oh, and, yeah. and, and, Susan. and Susan and, and yeah. Griffo. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm um, still in touch with two of them. Um, the others we lost touch with. Uh, and those two have done very well. Um, mm-hmm. You know, they went on to, they went on to have, um, you know, jobs and uh, contributing to society. Wow. Yeah. That's beautiful. Thank you for contributing that to their lives. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Um, okay, so let's dive in. How can we harness brain plasticity? It's a big one, huh? <laughs> Great question. Great question. So um, the great thing about the, about the brain is that, and this is something that um, scientists have studied for a long, long time, but but only recognized in the last 20 years or so that it takes place in human beings. Mm -hmm. Um, So there's this phenomenon called neuroplasticity or brain plasticity, um, which essentially is the ability of the brain to change, to transform. Um, It's both structurally and biochemically 
um, in response to three things. Uh, stimulation from the environment. So the things that we see, hear, touch, smell, and taste. Um, so that's the stimulation. Uh, second thing is the use of motor ability. So, you know, running around in the playground, um, talking with mom, um, using your hands to knit a sweater. Um, those are all motor abilities. So if you're so if you've got information coming into the brain, stimulation, you have output in the form of motor ability. And then the third component is the presence of adequate nutrition. So, you know, um, a decent diet. If you, get, if you have those three things in combination, the human brain changes. It just does. That's, mm -hmm. that's what happens. Now, when, I, when we began this work 45 years ago, um, anybody that talked like that was considered a nut. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Or, or, or charlatan. even worse, a charlatan. Um, and we were often accused of being charlatans back in the day. Um, and, uh, and, and it stayed that way until about the late 1990s. Um, and in the late 1990s, suddenly there is this rash of, um, of uh, uh, articles appearing mm -hmm. in the popular press about the incredible human brain and how it, how it changes. Um, <laughs> You're and, like, uh, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Uh, now what brought that change about was that um, previous to, to, uh, to the, to the invention of um, scanning technology, the only way that you could possibly prove that the brain can, that the brain changes would be th through surgery. You'd have to open up the, mm -hmm. you know, uh, the, the skull and, 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 and look at it. Mm -hmm. um, and, and you can't, and you can't do that over a period of time. I mean, for some reason, parents just get upset when doctors or scientists propose opening up their kid's head. Yeah. Um, so it was, it, it was almost an impossible position for those of us who talked about neuroplasticity as something that could happen in, in, in human beings, <clears throat> there was just no way at that time to be able to prove it in a way that would satisfy hardcore scientists. That all changed with the invention of scanning technology. So once we could ma once we married the computer with x-ray technology and produced, you know, PET scans and CAT scans and MRI scans and whatnot. Now, all of a sudden, there was a tool, not a non-invasive tool, that could be used to look at the brain and to look at it over a period of time. And so that, that technology started to be developed in the late 1970s. Um, and by the 1990s, 15, 20 years later, there was a pretty good um, uh, 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 bank of data available right for scientists to be able to say, look, we did a scan of this child when he was six months old. Now we've done another scan when he's two years old. And wow, look at the difference in his brain. Mm -hmm. It's completely changed. And so, um, so in 1997, uh, the Clinton administration held a, they, they held a conference um, in, uh, in Washington, D.C., uh, it was basically uh, a conference to look at brain development in well children, not kids with difficulties, but, you mm -hmm. know, quote, normal children. Um, and the conclusion of the conference was the brain grows through use. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, yeah. neuroplasticity <laughs> exists. What a surprise. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, exactly. So, um, so, so that's what neuroplasticity is. The question of how do you harness it? that gets down to having a good understanding of what it is that drives neuroplasticity. So how is it that, you know, you can, you can um, uh, take the laws and the, and the principles that govern brain development 
and apply them to try and purposefully change the brain. And if and and the answer to that really comes from observing um, children as they develop. Uh, what we see is th is that development happens in a very organized way. <clears throat> and I should I should yeah. I should put a caveat, don't, a yeah. caveat to that, provided that we give complete freedom to experience everything and provided that we don't interfere unnecessarily with a child's development, um, that development will follow a very, very prescribed pattern, a path. And, um, and we, can, we can, by observing that, we can glean certain principles from it, certain laws. So for example, one of the laws, one of the most basic laws that, that governs brain development is the idea that um, function and structure are intimately related, okay? Um, so, and we've recognized that with muscles for a long, long time, mm -hmm. okay? If you, you know, if you go to the gym and you work out every day, uh, you lift, you know, you do bicep curls, well, over time, you get bigger biceps, um, and you're not, you're not adding more muscle, muscle cells in your biceps. You're simply making the cells that are there bigger, stronger, more, and more effective at what they do. Mm -hmm. um, well, it turns out that the brain does the same thing. Right. And that's, and that's what neuroplasticity is. Mm -hmm. So really, neuroplasticity happens because of the law that says that function determines structure. Um, it's a very basic law of, of nature. Mm -hmm. And um, so, so if we pay attention to things like that, um, if, we, if, we, um, if we do things, we do activities um, with a certain amount of frequency, intensity, and duration, you know, th that, that's something we've been preaching for, again, for 45 years. And now you hear, you hear everybody talking about it. Um, even... You know, like uh, uh, basketball coaches will are, talk mm -hmm. about the frequency, intensity, and duration of their training programs. Well, all of that really has to do with brain development. Um, and um, so, so really, that's what harnessing brain plasticity is about. It's, it's understanding the laws and principles that govern how the brain develops and then applying them. Um, <clears throat> and you can do, you know, parents... Parents who have a child with difficulties can do that, um, as, as you know very well, uh, having, having done uh, things like that um, with your child. Um, and, um, and parents who have uh, well children, kids who, you know, that they're not even concerned, they're not concerned about. There's no obvious difficulty, but that's a brain waiting to be developed. Right. And, 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 and simply having an awareness of how that happens um, really changes everything um, for both the, for those parents as well as for that child. And that, that's why we started Brain Fit Kids. I don't know if you're familiar with, but I don't know, the idea is we see a lot of children that by the time they get to us in uh, children with more mild difficulties, no learning problems, in many cases, the problem is because the brain wasn't properly developed and properly organized when they were babies, when they were little. And so if parents understand that and understand how the brain works and what are the important stages for children to go through, we are preventing you know, a lot of problems later on mm -hmm. because they, you know, they, they do the right things. Right. Right. So it's, it's really important for parents to understand, for everybody, but especially the parent and the caregivers to understand how the brain functions. Do you, um, can you share a little bit more about Brain Fit Kids? Sure. Um, brain Fit Kids is a, <clears throat> is a project of, uh, of the Reach Family Institute um, that we started really um, out of frustration. Uh, you know, we kept having families contacting us um, and we kept, you know, we had friends who had young, young kids. And so we're, we're constantly hearing about, 
you know, all these children with, with reading difficulties and math difficulties and mm-hmm. behavior problems. And, speech. and um, not, not and, speaking until they were past three. And, and, and when we would, four. you know, and when we would investigate that a little bit further, over and over, over again, we would find that, you know, there wasn't any obvious, obvious reason for the problem. Um, you know, the kid didn't have a car accident, child didn't have, you know, an illness or anything like that, that, that was, that caused them to have the difficulty. And the more we looked at it, the more we became convinced that it was simply the result of poor developmental opportunities in the early years of life. Mm-hmm. And, um, and so we decided that we needed, we needed to start talking, not just to parents of kids who've got real obvious difficulties, mm-hmm. but we need to start talking to all parents mm-hmm. so, that, so that we can, first of all, try to have some sort of an impact on the, epi- on, on the, the pandemic of kids with learning and behavioral difficulties. Um, mm-hmm. Cause you know, a lot of times um, people look at a child, for example, with cerebral palsy, mm-hmm. a kid who, you know, is immobile, has a lot of obvious difficulties and they feel, they really, you know, they feel sorry for that child. They, you know, because the assumption is that that's going to be a really rough life. Um, and of course, if you don't, if you don't change those things, it, it, the, the, it, it's, it's difficult. But what most people don't realize is that for the kid um, who looks like all the other kids, but who isn't because they're failing in school or their behavior is terrible, you know, whatever the reason might be, for that child, life is actually a lot more difficult. People are not so kind. Because, yeah, because people look at him and they say, what's his problem? Um, You know. There, people are very unforgiving of that child. Mm-hmm. And, and so those kids really, really struggle. And we thought, you know, we've got to do something to try and change that. And one of the motivations was uh, the children that parents had come for the home program with their child that has, uh, I don't know, difficulties. They, if when we get them and the parents have other children afterwards and they apply to their new babies, mm-hmm. what they have learned from working with the kids with difficulties, they, uh, those kids end up being, you know, really well organized. They learn easily. They are mm-hmm. very social. They're just well-rounded. And, right. and that's just because parents had the knowledge and knew what to do when they had the, that baby. So, we see this and we're like, everybody should be doing. And those parents, you know, the parents that come for the home program you know, over and over and over again would say to us, oh, everybody should have this information. Everybody should know what we're doing uh, right and wrong when you're raising that baby. And so that's. Yes, I understand. Have. Because I went on to have lots of babies. Yeah. <laughs> right, exactly, exactly. And I and, parented <clears throat> them. You know, I evolved. Right, right, right. right. And you know, and, and another, another. Yeah, um, that's what, excuse me. So what we call parenting with the brain in mind. You know, we we call it. You know, the objective of uh, brain fit kids is to for parents to parent understanding the brain and you know, purpose purposefully. Not yes. doing things just because it's accidental or because they don't know any better. Yes, yes. Yeah. I, yeah, I, I'm sorry, I, I cut that's you off. okay. Yeah, <laughs> and 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 now I've lost the thought. That's okay. That's all right. What is um, what is holistic brain development? What do you call that? That's a, a, another another great question. So you know, there are so many things that influence how the brain develops. Um, you know, when we talk about neuroplasticity, right, right, right there, just talking about neuroplasticity, um, that kind of gi- gi- gives a sense of it. Um, so for neuroplasticity to happen, to repeat that, you have to have information coming in. So there needs to be sensory input. Um, you have to use motor ability. So you have to have some way of um, exercising, if you will, uh, 
you know, using um, abilities. And then there's the nutritional part of it. So those are sort of three sides um, to the to the neuroplasticity coin, if you will. Um, and the, the idea with holistic brain development is that, you know, we, we, we're, we're always trying to increase our odds of success with every child that we're working with. And so, so, you know, the, the, the brain, the brain is a system par excellence. Um, if you look at if you look at what happens in traditional treatment, um, and 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 I'm sure you know you, you know this well, Emily, because you know you 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 had to look at that you know at the beginning with with your son. Um, in traditional treatment, basically what we do is you know we 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 divide this the, the, this little this little kid into into a bunch of different categories so you get sent off to you know the physical therapist for to work on muscles you get sent off to the speech therapist so that you can find out you know where to put the tongue when you say a certain word uh, you go to the eye specialist to deal with the strabismus um, the neurologist, uh, the, the learning specialist, the psychologist, because of course, every kid who's got learning difficulties is gonna have psychological problems. So we end up reducing this child into parts. And most of the time, all of those different specialists kind of work in their own little world and nobody talks to anybody else. Um, and that's, a, that's what we call a reductionist approach. Um, and, um, and it just is not the way that the brain works. It's not the way it develops. Um, so, we, so what we teach is that the brain is a system par excellence. Um, so for example, when a child is down on the floor, moving around on hands and knees, okay, they're doing more than just building muscles. They are um, stimulating the brain, the parts of the brain that control those movements. They're using their eyes to look across the room. So they're developing vision. Um, they can feel the floor underneath them when they're moving. So there's tactile input. So you have all of these things going on simultaneously, contributing to a global brain development. And so that's the holistic nature of the brain. Um, and you can add to that um, nutrition, um, you know, uh, proper hydration. Uh, they're just, you know, uh, a myriad of things. Yeah, breathing. There's another good example. We pay a lot of attention to breathing in children. Why? Because the brain needs oxygen in order to survive, in order to thrive. And um, most of the kids we work with are not good breathers. Um, they, their, their breathing is very immature, even those, even the kids we work with who can walk and run. So holistic brain development really is in recognition of the, the fact that the brain um, develops um, and functions as a system, okay? Um, yeah. And the whole is more than the, uh, the sum of the parts. Yeah. 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 Many of these things resonated with me because I worked on all these different parts as well. Right. I mean, yeah. even the breathing and the oxygen. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I have, you know, other children and I'm still working on breathing. Um, yes, it's of so important because right, yes. they something as little as you know, little I say, but a child may be presenting with ADD or ADHD, mm -hmm. sure. and I've learned or I'm learning that you go back and it's like, well, how are they sleeping? Are they breathing through their nose? Right. Are mm -hmm. they getting enough oxygen all the time? Because if not, then it's going to show up. Exactly. In right. their behavior and how they're finding it easy or not to learn at school. Exactly. Right. 
Exactly. And, and a lot of children uh, today in our society, less and less children are, or babies, I should say, are learning how to crawl in their tummies, the army mm -hmm. crawl. Mm -hmm. And some will do hands and knees, but many are skipping that. You know, they're scooting their butts or, and they're not, and that, that crawling, the army crawl is really important. It's one of the first steps to develop breathing. Oh. Because you, when you're crawling, you know, you're doing the army crawl, you really, not just you're organizing the brain, but you not know, just talk about the tactile and, It's hard. You know, if we get down and yeah. crawl on the floor, it's a real hard thing. So it's a very, very important uh, step for a child to go through a function that to use, not just to learn, but to actually use that um, in terms of developing the brain, organizing the brain, mm -hmm. and improving breathing. Yeah. And actually, um, Uh, that bring, that brings to mind what I was going to say before that I oh, forgot. Good. There you go. Um, <laughs> so we we were still talking about brain fit kids, and um, and what I was going to say was that um, one of the one of the um, one of the big problems is that um, nowadays there are so many um, devices that parents either buy or are given as presents when they're, you know, expecting a child. Right. Um, that, <laughs> um, you know, th that are at least in their minds um, supposed to imp help with development that are actually And very convenient, that are actually very de easy. detrimental to development. Yeah. Um, How about you name a few of those? Well, you know, there's the, <laughs> there's the, the devices that they, that, parents put under a child. So even if they do put their child on their tummy, which is very rare nowadays, um, they'll rather than just put the child on the tummy and let them figure things out, they will, they'll, they'll put a little thing that, that hold, a, holds them a up. Bobby? It's called yeah, a bobby. Yeah, there you go. Um, <laughs> We don't there's the, 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 the little chairs that, that, that kids are sat, that they sit kids in today. With all the um, little entertainment things so they are happy they're standing and they walkers have all of those things, those things. i mean you know there's there are a whole bunch of different devices yeah. um and it, it, you know the only real device that anybody needs is a floor hmm. okay. and put the baby in um, the tummy yeah. and uh you know we uh concert has mentioned we have two grandchildren um our uh our daughter uh, and son-in-law have been very 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 much involved um, in brain fit kids from the time we, we started doing it. And, um, and they applied all of, all of, you know, the principles that we teach with their kids. And, um, and I mean, of course, obviously we're, there are grandchildren. We think they're magnificent. Um, but the, their physical, intellectual and social abilities are extraordinary compared to most of their peers. And, and yet, all of their peers have the exact same potential to have the same level of ability. Mm -hmm. okay. so, so they're, so, 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 so they're special to us, but they're not exceptional. Mm -hmm. um, all kids have the same possibilities. Mm -hmm. um, both both of, the, of the kids, Contessa mentioned about, you know, crawling on the tummy. Both of them crawled all day long, all day long, many months. Yeah, yeah, for months and months and months on their tummies. Um, they both are today uh, are um, nearly expert skiers. Um, our, our, our grandson skis double black diamond um, downhill runs uh, in Colorado. He's mm -hmm. seven. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, It's because his brain is very, very well organized. And when the brain is very well organized, um, you can do, you know, pretty amazing things physically. No, it's Everybody really, can. And it's really interesting because when he goes to sports or so both of them, you know, the, uh, the coaches always compliment and the teachers know how focused he is, how he listens and how well coordinated. And I'm like, mm-hmm. 
Mm-hmm. <laughs> you're very yes. proud. Yeah, exactly. But it's, it's just well, because they were, they were given the right uh, opportunity. Yeah. And on Brain Fit Kids, we, we do blogs. We have been pretty bad lately. But uh, we have blogs and have videos, actually, for that parents can see, you know, the suggestions of, you know, because a lot of um, when it comes to crawling, tummy crawl, the babies don't get put on their tummies very very early on. Yeah, not very often these days. Not often. Yeah. And so when they, by the time that they're starting to be put, they're not used to, so they don't like it. And people mm-hmm. are like, well, doesn't like it, so no, stop. And not realizing what that means. So we kind of give tips uh, also you know, to for parents on how they can get their babies to... Because the Just, idea yeah. is to get them crawling and to not skip over that. Right. Because exactly. It yeah. it's, helps with so much of the organization of the brain, right? Right. Precisely. Right. Exactly. And and now I know breathing. Yeah. And breathing. Yeah. yeah. Breathing. Yeah. yeah. Um, so how is it possible for parents, even those without um extra means to throw at their lots of therapies and treatments to succeed with their brain injured children when professionals fail? Boy, that's a superb question. Um, (laughs) It's possible because in the end, um, in order to change a child's life, um, all you really need is the belief that it's possible, the determination to do the hard work, and you already have the love and for the child and nobody cares more about that child succeeding than a parent. Mm -hmm. And no, I mean, we love every child we've seen, we worked with, and we call, don't know, we refer to our and as, as our families, mm-hmm. the, the parents that are in the program, they are our families. And people are like, how many kids do you have? We're like, well, actually, we have one that's blood, but we have many children out there. But we could never accomplish what the parents can accomplish if we give them the information. So they need information. Yeah. So, so we, so we, um, we had an opportunity many years ago uh, to really put that to the test. Um, we were doing work in um, in Venezuela, and um, we were working with families who, you know, brought us down there um, uh, to. There was a foundation uh, as as, yeah. as consultants. There was a foundation that was funding the work, um, and through through that, in the course of that, um, you know, we 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 you know we saw uh, that. Most of the families in Venezuela were extremely, extremely poor. Um, and of course, they have poor families have brain injured children, too, um, indeed, far, far more frequently than uh, upper class families um, because of problems like malnutrition, um, poor sanitation, et cetera. And so um, so we had we had this opportunity to create a project um, with the poor uh, in order to try and demonstrate that anybody could do this, you know? Mm -hmm. And, um, so, um, our friends down there who had, who had the foundation, um, said that they would, you know, they would fund it. And, uh, we started doing, uh, consultations with, in the beginning, just three families, because we had no idea if it was going to work or not. Um, we just knew that there was an incredible need and nobody was meeting the need. Mm-hmm. So we thought, well, you know, I mean, the program that we teach is a, is a home program. Um, and um, so as, as long as we can explain all of this in a way that's understandable for these families, and as long as they're, they've got the determination to put it into practice, who knows, who knows what might happen? Yeah. So, um, so we began, a, began the project with three families from the slums. Um, and within four years, we had about 32 families and we had a waiting list of more than 500. Oh. Yeah. And at that point, um, we decided 
that we needed to take the project to another level because mm-hmm. it wasn't fair, you know, to dangle a carrot in front of the families and say, you know, we'll give it to you in another 10 years. Mm-hmm. Um, and we were, we were not prepared at that point to move to Venezuela. Um, so, so what we did was we created a training program mm-hmm. um, for professionals and over the course of 10 years from 1992 to 2002, we trained over 200 um, doctors, uh, physical therapists, occupational therapists, speech therapists, psychologists, and special ed teachers, um, how to do what we do. And we were, um, this was well before Chavez, um, you know, the, the Venezuelan dictator. Um, and so we were able to work out a relationship with the Venezuelan government, whereby we would provide the, the, the training and uh, they would allow the doctors and therapists and whatnot who worked within the, pu- the public system, mm-hmm. they would allow them to, um, you know, to do our program in addition to whatever else they did. So, you right. know, the physical therapist might do physical therapy, but he would also, but, but he or she would also teach a family how to do, how to do our program at home. Mm-hmm. Um, and they get, they had their salaries. So the families didn't have to pay yeah. anything. Yeah. So, so it was really, it was a really unique, um, interesting arrangement. And, um, and it was spectacular. Um, it, 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 it be- it became so popular that, um, I mean, we ended up with 34 clinics all over Venezuela, um, but many of them in the big cities, but many of them way out in the countryside, some of them deep in the jungle, wow. uh, in little villages uh, scattered in the Amazon and the Orinoco Delta. Um, and uh, we, were, we taught at, the, um, at, at one of the main universities in Caracas. Uh, so we had, you know, we had the, uh, the backing of the medical community there. Um, it was quite, it was quite a wonderful experience. Yes. And we had one family in particular that I remember being at the consultation and we were talking, discussing the changes and all the improvements that their child was doing. And the mom says, well, you know, I just wish I had known about this because I have another child at home, 18 years old, so an older child who is brain damaged. And I couldn't give her any help when she was younger because you know, if you live in the slums or in a place where you don't have a car, you, you know, in South America, you have to get in a bus that is very, you cannot carry a child to therapy twice or three times a week or even once a week under that circumstance. So those children really got no help whatsoever. Mm. They had nothing uh, before. So that uh, was incredible to, to have learned and to think about, you know, because when we started was not even, we hadn't even considered all of that. But, the, but as long as parents have determination, like you said, and are willing to work and you know, they, were, they were poor, but they love their children and they are not afraid to do the work and they have big families that can help that pitch in. Yeah. So the results, you know, the results that we got with the, you know, the families in Venezuela, um, I would, I would match, I would put them up against um, any of the results that we've gotten with families anywhere else in the world, any day of the week. Um, They proved beyond, beyond uh, a doubt that, um, that you know, one does not need to be wealthy, um, nor does one need to have a university a degree. degree in order to be able to help your child. Hmm. Um, again, you just need to have belief, determination, and love. Did we um, answer the question? Yeah. Yes, yes. <laughs> um, I know that we touched on this one a little bit already, but um, why is there such an epidemic of learning and behavior problems today in your mind? Well, I think it's, I think it, it primarily, I think it comes down to several things. A, a huge thing is the way in which we raise children. Um, people just, you know, people just don't, um, don't understand um, how this, mar- this marvelous thing develops. And, um, 
And so, you know, they're all, I, I, as I mentioned before, you know, all the devices and whatnot. You know, if, if, you, if you interfere with the development of human mobility, um, right, off, right, right from the get-go, you are interfering with the development of the human brain. Right. Okay. They, th- those two things are, go hand in hand. So, um, so to the extent that you interfere with that, that development, you're, you're setting your child up for difficulties. Um, I think another big problem is, uh, to- is toxins um, in the environment. Um, I, think that's a, a, I think that's a huge problem with, for example, you know, people always want to know, you know, what causes autism? Um, I, I, you know, I think that that's, it, it, it's, it's far too complex a problem to boil down to one cause. I think mm-hmm. that there are a lot of things that, that contribute to it, but certainly a toxic environment is a big, big problem. Um, yeah. Uh, and, and also I would say um, when you have for me, for me, when I started trying to heal my own son, that's when I started getting really clean and healthy and eliminating toxins because also his his brain was already compromised. Right. right. And I needed to give him the best, safest, cleanest mm-hmm. environment. For right. Healing. Exactly. Yeah. That's how I, I thought of it back then. Yes. Like, yeah. No, you're absolutely you're absolutely right. So but we should all think that's the thing. So we should all think like that. Regardless. We should anyway, but anyway, more, because you have a baby, often, and yes, yeah, but more often than not, people don't think like that, right? right. Until something happens, right. either exactly, and some someone themselves or in their family gets sick, or someone that they know, right? Um, yes, well, you know, we we always say that most people never appreciate the miracle of development until it doesn't happen. Yes, that's you know? true. And yeah. so, so yeah. yeah. And, and, and again, um, to get back to brain fit kids, that's a big part of what we try to do mm-hmm. is to, is to create that awareness of, you know, of all of the things um, that contribute to, you know, uh, good brain development and, and, and successful function. Yeah. Um, you know, in the, in the end, all we, all we really want to do um, for kids is to, is to give, is to put them in a position, position, put them in a position functionally where they can do whatever they want to do uh, according to what excites them, what motivates them. Um, and, uh, and then we just leave the choice up to them. Mm -hmm. it's like you know sometimes people think you know you're trying to i mentioned about my grandson and you know he's such a good skier uh that's just that that simply just happened um it's not opportunity yeah well yes he was given he had the opportunity opportunity to learn how to ski um but the fact that he has become so good at it is because he has a brain that could take advantage of it Mm mm-hmm Mm-hmm. And uh, I mean, for example, um, our daughter, when 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 she was young, uh, we kind of lived the lives of gypsies. We we traveled all over the world. We worked in we worked on virtually every continent except Antarctica. And we took her with us. Um, uh, even when she went to school, uh, we chose we, the school. The schools that we that we put her in were those that agreed to our crazy lifestyle. Mm-hmm. Uh, was school and homeschooling and combination. Um, anyway, yes. but but um, by the time she was about four or five years old, she could speak four languages. Wow! Um, With accent from the region where she was, we worked. Yeah, and even <laughs> and, and today she continues to be. She's fluent in four languages. Um, but again, I'll repeat that. Of course, we think that she's magnificent, but she's not exceptional. Hmm. Um, every also child, every yeah. child has the same potential to be able to speak more than one language, if given the opportunity, and if, and brain, if they have the brain uh, that is developed to be able to take advantage of the opportunity. Yes. Yeah. So. I love that. Okay. So can you tell us about the REACH Family Institute? Um, what does the REACH method entail? I know you mentioned it a couple times here, 
but I don't feel that we have, all, and everyone has the full oh. picture here. Right, right. So, so REACH is a nonprofit organization um, that, was, uh, that was formed in um, 1998. Um, and, um, and basically- uh, we, were, we were in practice before, but it was private. Right. Practice. Right, okay. Uh, and, and so, and basically REACH's work um, is uh, primarily with, um, with children and young adults uh, who have developmental difficulties, um, kids who are brain injured and, you know, lots and lots of other different diagnoses. Uh, and, and the idea behind REACH is that um, we're trying to empower parents primarily parents, um, to be able to um, transform their children's lives through an understanding of how the brain develops mm -hmm. and an application of the principles that contribute to it. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's really what REACH does. Uh, the REACH method is, um, is, well, you know, kind of, is kind of the, the result of uh, 45 years of working at this, um, it's uh, applied at home. So, you know, the, um, uh, we, we strongly believe that parents are by far the best teachers um, and therapists for their children uh, and uh, provided that they have a good understanding of, um, you know, what it is that they're doing. Mm -hmm. um, and we already talked about, you know, sort of the, the basic ingredients of belief, right. determination, and love, and um, and and if parents have all of those things, uh, they do an extraordinary job. So, so that so the so it, the program is a home program um, done by parents mostly. Um, it I mean you know we we have done the program in schools um, in Venezuela, for example. We had. Uh, we had program done in a lot of schools mm -hmm. and those kids did beautiful um, but 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 most of the work of reach is one-to-one -one with families right. mm -hmm. and and we we basically are i mentioned earlier that we focus on function on what the child can do you know i think that's another thing when parents go to a doctor to a neurologist or mm -hmm. whoever they are often they often leave the, the consultation depressed because they've been told, no, your child cannot do this, I cannot do that. Yes. And, and then even worse, <laughs> we'll never do this or that. And uh, and it's it's like, you know, it's totally depressing and it's not right to, mm -hmm. to say because, first of all, nobody knows what a child will or will not be able to do if we do the right things. And if you say to any parent, your child will never be able to learn to read and you believe as a parent, then you're not going to do anything to try to even teach. Why waste your time? Yes. So then it becomes, but anyway, so we, well, it, be, it becomes a self-fulfilling process. Yes. 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 And so we focus on what, and, and uh, all, the parents already know what the child cannot do. It's like, tell me something that I don't know. So what we're looking at when we're evaluating a child is we're looking at what can the child do. Mm -hmm. So, and we're looking at a vision, hearing, understanding, tactile ability, language, manual ability, and mobility, right? Correct. So we have the six areas. Uh, and so we're, we're starting from where's the child is today and, and now we're going to design a program that always has a physical part to it, physical a program, an intellectual or sensory program or both, depending on the level of the child, mm -hmm. and nutrition. Physiology. And physiology. Physiology. Mm -hmm. So nutrition, breathing. The, mm -hmm. uh, so we are... Um, and then we decide actually one other thing to add to physiology light. so yeah is, is light light yeah, um, sunlight okay. sunlight is incredibly important uh, for brain function um, mm -hmm. we've been we've been working with uh, with light colored light um, for 30 years um, but everybody thought we were nuts when we started doing that too <laughs> <laughs> now 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 it's now it's the fad 
But anyway, they, yeah, so we then, uh, then we design a program and we teach the program to the parents and they'll go home and they'll apply the, the program. And then we see them every so often, maintain contact with us in between if there is any questions or anything that we need to, to adapt. But what, uh, what we are looking at is what can your child do today and how can we get this child to the next step so yes, to the next step to the next step <laughs> and you know and the, the thing with uh, parents and you know, the lack of uh, support the hope that uh, they get it's really a sad thing because we've been doing this for more than 40 years and that is not a bit different today than was 40 years ago where parents will go to you know especially if you have a severe uh, brain damage or you know, a child that has severe difficulties, the, it's pretty depressing. We have a, a little, a, a young girl that we work with, uh, Mackenzie, I'm thinking about that. Uh, we saw her for the first time, we were living in the Bay Area. No, we were in Oregon. We were living in Southern Oregon. And uh, she came from South Dakota? South Dakota. And so the first child, she was Two years old when it started? Yeah, she was two, two years, years old. old. She was diagnosed. She, she came with a diagnosis of hydranencephaly. Um, so basically, uh, hydranencephaly means that um, at some point in fetal development, the brain stops developing. Um, in, her, in her case, it was after the brain stem had developed, mm -hmm. but before the cortex began to develop. So most, and, yeah. and so... Development stops at that point, and then the rest of the skull is just filled with fluid. Um, so Mackenzie came to us at two years of age. She um, was a very rigid, blind, uh, no, very rigid, very tight. Yes. When we put her on her tummy, she would cry because mm -hmm. it was so tight that it was painful mm -hmm. uh, to her. Uh, she was not being too fed. Because, but oh. they were wanted to because mom was fighting uh, that because she said, no, she can, she's eating. So, but no, she, she didn't have enough weight or the mm -hmm. doctor were not happy that she, with, the amount, with her weight. So they wanted to make it easy and just to feed her. She's never gone on to feeding this girl. She's now uh, well, so, uh, 12. She's, okay, she's, 13, she's 13. 13. Um, she's, she's a teenager now, believe it or not. Um, she uh, she was not supposed to live till uh, till her first birthday. Till her first birthday, yeah. and then when she did that, the doctors said she wouldn't live to her second birthday, and then the third. Um, anyway, today Mackenzie can see, uh, she can understand, uh, she's she's beginning to communicate, um, and she's doing all of these things without a cortex. And and there's the program in school. Which, which, which is another, which, which the school does a program with her, which from our, you know, from a basic anatomical understanding of the brain is impossible. Hmm. So, and she can, she's now uh, able to communicate or begin to communicate to a computer mm -hmm. using her eyes. Oh, yeah. So, there's a yeah. kid that was not blind using her eyes. She can, she's, she really, she's really, she's an extraordinary kid. Um, really happy. Uh, a, no. one, a wonderful example of uh, why you should never say never. Yeah, mm -hmm. and and the, and what the brain is capable of because all the things she's doing, she's she's not even supposed to have the brain parts to do that. Right. So it's really uh, beautiful, incredible. Yes. Yeah. 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 So it's been hard work, but you no, know, she's still on, she's still on the program. Like I said, the school is applying the program uh, with her, and that's wonderful. Yeah. 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 Yes. Very unusual. Actually. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I think. <laughs> yeah. I think it's small it's, town. <laughs> it's 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 uh, it's the advantage of small town America. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah and something that I, I I I we should probably add is that you know we talk about transformation in the children, um, but it's also extraordinary to watch the transformation in parents, um, because and and I yeah. and Mackenzie's mom is a great example. Um, you know when she came to us in the beginning. Uh, she was, you know, very young um, and first child, first child, very young and, and 
you know, kind of meek. Um, and today she is a lioness. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yes, and in fact, and, and talking we, about this, excuse me, but uh, talking about the you know, parents getting so much negativity, I, I'll never forget an email that we got from her, from the mom, maybe within a couple of years of being the program. Or so it's been quite a few years now that she she said you no know, she, she's writing and saying okay I saw a new uh, neurologist and and she said which of course I left the, there really depressed because he proceeded to tell me she's not going to live past the age of ten and uh, and you no know, all these things before even touching the child you know just by looking at her and looking at the diagnosis he gave her all this bad news and she said and so of course I proceeded to tell him how he was wrong and you know that I was told this then and I was told that then and then uh, and she says at the end of the email she goes but this one I'm keeping the and she meant the neurologist because I'm going to educate him <laughs> and they were like, yes, because you know that's the thing is that uh, you talk about how the way that you raise your children has been affected by or changed because of your experience with the child, and you know a lot of professionals change how they of practice course. when they they go through themselves. You know, they mm -hmm. stop saying things like this will never happen. Mm -hmm. Yeah which I don't think they should say. No, never. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Totally. Um, okay. Well, how can our audience find out more about you and your work? Uh, well, so we have two websites. Um, one of the, the Reach Family Institute website is lowercase um, reach family Seven. institute altogether dot org. And Brain Fit Kids uh, website is uh, altogether brainfitkids.com, C O M. Um, they also can write to us at um, admin at reachfamilyinstitute.org, um, or they could call us at 541 mm. Oh, and um, we also uh, on on the Brain Fit Kids um, website, we have a blog that has um, a wealth of information. Um, so there are a lot of a lot a lot of posts there about all aspects all, all aspects of development. Um, and and, uh, and there's schedule. yeah, there, and and there's a um, uh, again on the Brain Fit Kids website, there is a free uh, email course that young parents, so it's really designed for um, parents who are expecting a baby okay, or parents who have a baby in the first, three years, first yeah. three, well, really first six months yeah. of life. Yeah, or better. Um, <laughs> um, uh, and that's a, that's a free email course. Um, we give also consultations. Parents have concerns. They can, uh, we have a 20 minutes free consultation and there's a form on the website that they can fill in so we know what they can schedule and know what time, uh, not what time, what their concerns are. And of course, if it's a parent with a child experiencing uh, difficulties, they can contact us and we can schedule time to explain more, answer any of their questions. And we often will put the parents in contact with parents that either have done or join the program so they have an idea. That's good. In, from the yeah because it's always bad i think parents from parents you no know, we yeah. get the, our best families are recommend are referred by other families right, mm -hmm. right. yeah word of mouth is is works very well is there anything else that you both would like to share with the brain possible community today to be complete well, first, is the name of your organization is great because poss possible and possibility never give up on your child and never believe anybody in what your child can do or want to or how long they're going to live. We don't know any of, we don't know that for ourselves. Right. None of us know that. So, so be positive and, 
and don't give up on the child. Yeah, yeah. thank you. Yeah, I mean, I you know, I think that, um, boy, I, I, I don't know that we said this, but I think that, you know, something that for us is really important um, is that parents see their children. So I'm talking about, you know, parents who've got kids that they're concerned about. Um, I think it's important that parents see their children as children mm -hmm. first and only secondarily as a child with a difficulty. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it drives me nuts when I, I read things about, you know, um, an autistic child or a Down syndrome child. Mm -hmm. Now, it's a child with autism mm -hmm. or a child with mm -hmm. Down mm -hmm. syndrome. Um, the problem when, 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 when you say the autistic child, the problem is that autism then defines the child. Mm -hmm. And as soon as you do that, you automatically place limitations on that child. You change how not only you look at the child, but how society looks at the child. Um, and that's really damaging. Um, yeah. So for us, you know, that, that's, it's, it's really important that we see kids as kids first. Um, and it doesn't change the fact that they're struggling. Um, but what it does do is it changes your mindset about it. Right. Um, and, um, and, you know, uh, the, the, the brain is an extraordinary, extraordinary thing. Um, it's this, this marvelous gift that we're all given. Um, and its potential is boundless, you know, uh, and, um, and all we need to do is, is give it what it needs in order to realize that potential. Yeah. And then we just leave the rest up, up to, uh, um, up to God, up to the universe, where, you know, however, whatever your belief system uh, says. But. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much for your time. And it really was an honor to meet you and to sit here speaking with you and learning from you and all of your many years of experience. Well, thank you, Emily. Thank you, it's, yes. uh, um, it's been, it's been our, our pleasure and, uh, and it's been an honor too. Absolutely. And thank you for helping us spread the word and let people know about the work and the possibilities. I hope you enjoyed our conversation today and that you learned something new. Do you have a question for Charles and Kansai Tsawan? Do you have your own story to share? We would love to hear from you. Let us know how we can be useful in your journey. Email us at info at thebrainpossible.com. Be sure to subscribe, follow, and share our podcast if that feels true for you. You may also consider visiting our website for more information on stories, therapies, and products that we think that you will love and may support you in your healing journey. As always, thank you for spending your precious time with us at The Brain Possible. See you next week and be well.